So, you know, I've been looking at the coverage of this Cuomo situation as it's been really, you know, ramping up and then just staying almost at a fever, fever pitch the last few days. And if you've watched my other videos, any of my other videos on the subject, I've made now several hours worth of videos uh, over the last six months about this, this Andrew Cuomo controversy. And I've gone through the allegations. I've read the interviews with the accusers. I, I recently read the AG's report uh, in, in detail. And my conclusion is that this is, for lack of a better word, it's, it's, it's basically a witch hunt that Cuomo, it, first of all, that most of these allegations, the vast majority of them are just ridiculous. I mean, if you just read it and think about it, it's ridiculous. And the few that are of concern about uh, alleged groping incidents, well, there's, there's issues with, with those. And so anyway, here's my point is that I was looking at all of this, this coverage, this terrible coverage that he's getting. And I'm thinking, you know, what can he really do? I know that he, I know that he came out with, he made a statement on camera. Um, it, it was okay. Personally, I didn't think it was that effective. Um, and then he, his attorney, uh, Rita Glavin or Glavin, uh, she released a, a much more in-depth statement and a kind of response to the allegations that I thought was super strong. And I think if I were Cuomo in his office, his people, I would be really pushing that uh, statement that they released through their attorney where, because there's so many, there's so many interesting things that that statement gets into in terms of uh, inconsistencies with the accuser's stories, problems with the accuser's backgrounds, um, and problematic histories related to, to these charges, these allegations, um, things that the, that the accusers left out of their statements, out of their allegations, uh, and then actual like evidence in the form of texts and stuff like that even. And so my point is, I thought it was a really strong that the, the written statement released through the attorney, you know, the, with all of the different, uh, you know, subsections and everything. I thought that was really good. But here's the thing that I was thinking about is like, you know, a lot of people, most people are not going to read a report, They're not going to read a, you know, a legal looking, doc, a legal document. And so what could Cuomo do? And I was trying to think about like, what would be the most effective statement that he could give? You know, what, what would I say if I were Cuomo and I only had like a brief shot at, 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 at getting my message across to the people, right? So if I had like one brief speech that I was going to give or one brief statement, and I know he's already given a statement, but like this is the statement that I think I would give. And maybe it's not a very good, like politically correct statement. Maybe it would end up getting him in more trouble. Uh, I don't know. But this is, I feel like people really are yearning for someone to speak to them like like a, a real human being. And so I didn't have a, pro a huge problem with the statement that Cuomo made earlier, except that it just still seemed a little sort of like politician-y. And I think that things are to the point now, you know, come on. I mean, things are really bad for him politically. Everybody has turned on him almost. Uh, you know, he's got uh, he's got a few defenders in the Republican Party uh, and, and apparently on Newsmax. It's kind of interesting. Um, so, uh, but, uh, you know, things are not good. Things are not good. And, you know, I was really displeased to see that Bill Maher recently on his show, what was it, last night, you know, I have some issues with Bill Maher at times, but I think I really like the fact that Bill Maher seems to be a kind of an iconoclast and he's an individual and he's he doesn't and, and he sees through a lot of BS at times. OK, even though there's a lot of stuff I disagree with him about or he find, I find annoying. But here's the thing. I thought for sure that Bill Maher would see through this this Cuomo BS, because if you just take even a cursory look at the AG report that was released and you see like how many of these allegations are just ridiculous and how. And, 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 you know, does no one remember, does Bill Maher not remember that ridiculous woman that came out uh, who was a flood victim and whose home Cuomo toured uh, when he was doing disaster relief stuff? And she came out with Gloria Allred and she claimed that Cuomo had, had somehow assaulted her because he kissed her on the cheek in front of, like, everybody, including cameras. I mean, this is the level of BS that we're dealing with. I talk about it in my other videos. And so it was very, you know, it bothered me to see that Bill Maher was just going along blindly with the sheep on this. And he, and everybody seems really fixated. I have to say, everybody seems really fixated on this idea of Cuomo as a sleazy guy. Oh, you know, do you know how many times I've heard people in my, actually in my own life, okay, like friends of mine and stuff, even a significant other uh, saying, oh, that creep. They like to say that, that creep. Or that, and then, and Bill Maher would call them a sleaze, a sleaze. I guess there is something about Cuomo that when some people look at him, that's what they see. 
but I don't understand all of these people who just assume that they know that a man is sleazy or a creep. It's like people almost take are taking delight now and piling on, even though they haven't. I just don't believe that they've really looked at the allegations because if you really look at this and you're not coming in from a place of, of, of political hatred, you know, that's the problem too, is Cuomo's got a lot of political hatred directed toward him. And I don't want to get into, there's the whole argument about the nursing home thing and, you know, how much at fault he was or how bad that was or it wasn't or whatever. And I don't even want to get into that, but I'm just saying like what's happening to him with the Me Too stuff. All right. Um, it's, it's not, it's not right. And so it's a shame for me to see people like Bill Maher just kind of giving into it. I thought he would be able to see through this or would take a deeper look. Okay, so here's the thing. How does Cuomo, how does Cuomo get people to take a deeper look at this situation or give it, give it a second thought? Because right now everybody is just, it just seems like he's just running with the narrative of this creepy, sleazy guy who's out there, who was harassing his employees and created a hostile workplace, et cetera. Okay, so those of us who've read the AG's report and know and some of these facts and who've read the statement that uh, Cuomo's attorney put out that actually had some evidence in it, we know differently, but 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 your average person is not going to read a legal report, and they're not going to do again, and they don't have time. And I get it; people have like kids and lives and stuff. Okay, so how? What is a what is a succinct way that Cuomo could get his message across in a statement? So if, if I were Cuomo, and I'm not going to, and this is not going to be the most probably eloquent because I'm just kind of like I'm not I'm, I didn't write this right. This is just sort of me on the fly. If I were Cuomo, I would come out and I would give a speech like from the gut, okay? I would give a speech because people, again, people want authenticity. They want the sense of authenticity from someone. And I think that when you're in the place that Cuomo is in now, where, um, where, your, back, where, your, where your back is against the wall, then it's time to start coming, coming out from the gut, reaching from the gut, okay? That's like a kind of a gross way of putting it, but you know what I'm saying. So this is what I, this is what I would say, all right? I know that things look really bad. I know that you're reading all of this stuff in the media about, and seeing all this stuff in the media about uh, how I've harassed a number of women who work for me, and there are all of these accusers and all of these accusations against me. I know that it also looks bad that most people in both parties have turned against me. The president has asked me to, has told me to resign. Uh, I know that it seems like there's really only one narrative right now that's that's getting pushed by the media and so everybody just assumes that i'm guilty and that there's no other there's no other uh side to the story but let me tell you if you actually read the attorney general's report the one that the media has been touting for days now proclaiming my guilt if you actually read that document what you find is that the vast majority of the charges against me are just frivolous, flimsy, and ridiculous. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, one of my accusers uh, felt that she was harassed because I said that she was wearing an outfit that looked like a lumberjack. All right. Well, that's what the outfit looked like to me, and I was just making a joke. I wonder if any of you have ever made jokes before at the office about uh, an interesting outfit uh, that one of your coworkers was wearing. And you know, I didn't realize that the term lumberjack had a sexual connotation, so I'm not really sure how that sexual harassment, okay? It was a joke. Uh, another woman complained that I called her a sponge. Why did I use this nickname with her? Uh, because she was new to the job and I had told her that it was important that being new to the job, that she tried to absorb as much information, as much of what was going on around her as possible, just like a sponge. And so it was a funny little nickname. You know, I try to do things like this uh, because I like to individually recognize the people who work for me because that then if they feel like they're more than just a, a nameless office assistant to me, then they tend to feel more appreciated and they tend to work harder for me. So actually, you know, I do try to foster in my workplace a sense of rapport, a sense that I care about each employee, that each employee is individually significant to me. And one of the ways that I might occasionally do that is by giving them, you know, a harmless nickname or making some joke about the clothing. So sponge, yes, that apparently by calling her that, that I was harassing her in that way as well. 
Uh, there's another accuser who said that she felt harassed because at a, uh, a party, I believe it was a wedding, uh, I put my, I went to embrace her and I put my hand on her back and her back, her dress had a cutout in the back. Well, I would defy anyone in my audience to, uh, to come up with, uh, to not be able to come up with a time where you also put your hand on someone's back when you were embracing them. All right. And that's all that she alleges as I embraced her and my hand touched her back. There's another allegation made by an anonymous state trooper that I, I suppose she says assaulted her because when she was holding the door open for me and I was passing through the door in, a, in what was a very crowded environment, she says that I ran my finger across her stomach. Not her private parts, not her breast, across her stomach briefly, all right? Well, it's very clear if you read the Attorney General's report as it describes that story that what was happening is that she was, she was my basically my bodyguard. She was ushering me through a really crowded area, holding the door open for me, and as I was walking through, my hand, apparently, my finger lightly brushed across her stomach. So I just want those of you who are listening right now to understand that if we take uh, this Attorney General's report and the assumptions that the media and much of the people against me are making about my guilt, then henceforth from now on, you should be very careful that you never in a crowded situa situation accidentally, you know, bump someone or accidentally have your hand touch someone's stomach or that you never embrace someone in such a way uh, as to uh, touch their back because these things are the primary grounds for uh, the, the allegations against me. And you might say, well, wait a minute, though. I've heard that you are accused of groping. Well, there are uh, basically two complaints against me uh, that I'm, I'm not brushing off if they, were, if they were true as being frivolous complaints. Uh, one complaint is that I uh, groped someone's rear butt. Another complaint is that I groped someone's breast. However, as I said in the, in the statement that my attorney released recently, I have corroborating evidence to the fact that the anonymous woman who has accused me of groping her breast uh, actually was sending text to other people that day, very sort of casual, happy text uh, indicating no attack, no trauma, no assault, no harassment, nothing like that. In fact, she texted uh, one person on my staff, and this is documented in the report that my attorney released, she texted one person on my staff asking if she could stick around, uh, if she needed to stick around later to help out. All right. So there's nothing indicating, and, and I have corroborating witnesses, you know, none of whom saw anything amiss or awry with her or me or anything that day. All right. So, yes, there is this one allegation uh, that if it were true, it would not be good. Okay, but it's not true. It's simply not true. And by the way, uh, my attorneys and I believe that uh, the actions that this accuser is taking are the precursor to her filing a civil lawsuit against me. Uh, we have reasons, my attorneys have reasons for thinking that, but that is coming. And you should be assured that the, these charges that are being leveled against me are not from disinterested people. These are people who are seeking money from me or who have issues with me or trying to advance their own political careers. I'm speaking there at the end uh, in terms of political careers of Lindsay Boylan, for instance, another one of the main accusers. And uh, Lindsay Boylan, as, as stated in my uh, statement that my attorney released, uh, Lindsay Boylan has a problematic history with me and my office that predates these sudden allegations that she started making several months ago. All right. Uh, prior to those allegations, she had always uh, spoken of me publicly as an amazing governor, and is even at one point saying that I was actually one of the safe, uh, one of the better places to work for women. And uh, so, you know, this this was a, this turnabout occurred because of a falling out that she had with me and with our office over her um, her um, the election in which she ran against uh, Gerald Nadler. She had some issues with some decisions that our office made in regard to those elections, and she was angry, uh, and she felt like we were not receptive to her concerns, and basically she threatened us uh, in a text that was sent to one of my staffers, and that is also in the legal document that my attorney released. Now, uh, the other person that I, I want to mention is Charlotte Bennett. She was also one of my main accusers, and you might have seen her 
doing the rounds on interviews uh, over the last several months and recently. But if you, again, if you look at the statement that my attorney released recently, uh, Charlotte Bennett has a problematic history in my office as well. And there were things that I chose and I'm choosing not to disclose about that history and about her and, uh, and how, uh, and her uh, behavior in that role. Uh, but there, she, you know, there is, there was problems, there were problems that she had in my office. Uh, part of what I was trying to do in, in speaking with her about her past trauma and how to deal with it, and also inquiring into uh, whether she felt okay in, in the situation she was in, I was trying to help her based on some of these issues that she had been having. Uh, also, she misinterprets, significantly misinterprets uh, a number of exchanges that we had between the two of us. Uh, it seems that she had in her mind a kind of a pre-existent narrative uh, that was very focused on sexual assault. Um, you know, the, one of the first conversations that we ever had, she brought up sexual assault in the conversation that we had where she accuses me of being too, uh, too familiar with her or speaking about too private, uh, a too private matter. Well, she's actually the one who brought up the sex and sexual assault. This is someone who, um, whether due to her own previous trauma or for some other reason, is very fixated on the subject. There are a number of people in my office who could attest to that. And she simply misinterpreted a number of things that, that I was saying to her, okay? So there are occasionally times when I will tell jokes in the office, you know, um, but, uh, it, you know, one example would be when Ms. Bennett uh, said to me, wow, Governor, the women really like you, based on she was looking at some of the social media responses to me. And that was, and, and that's what Ms. Bennett said. Wow, Governor, the women really like you. And I, in reply to her, said, ha ha, well, maybe you can get me a girlfriend from among that batch. And to this, this is what she's referring to when she says that I, quote, asked her uh, to get me a girlfriend. Okay, so I want you to understand, and if you, you know what, you can, you can disbelieve it if you want to. At this point, I don't care. I'm, I, I'm going, I'm making this statement because I want the truth on the record and because I'm tired of, of being afraid of these ridiculous people who are lying and misrepresenting and trying to take me down politically. And so just understand that in Charlotte Bennett's testimony and in these interviews, you are getting a very, very distorted perception of events. All right. And so, you know, I, um, I think there is something very true in that, that line from that famous movie that probably a number of you have seen. And it goes like this. You either die a hero or you live to see yourself become the villain. And I had a period of, of feeling, you know, what it was like to be, to be considered a hero. And I, I'm not saying that I was a hero per se. But I damn well did my best for the people of New York during the pandemic. And it was a scary time. It was a time when we didn't all, often we didn't know what, what the right thing to do, the best thing to do was. We had limited information. We had all of this incoming fire in a way. And so, you know, I did the best that I could. I'm proud of my record. I'm proud of my record for the state of New York and the people of New York. And whatever happens with this, I want you to know the truth. And, uh, and I hope that you will take just a little time to think for yourself and to look into it instead of just going along with what everyone else is saying. Because, well, that's not really the New York way, right? All right. Thank you. So I don't know. Maybe that was, like, not very good. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, that's what, I would, that's what I would say. And, again, like, I didn't write that speech. It's just, like, coming, you know, from my, my brain as I'm thinking about it. But I wanted to give you a sense of what I would say, right? So even if that's not, like, totally on target or there were some mistakes I made or whatever, like, that's, that's kind of, like, what I would go with. So I don't know. Yeah. I, Governor Cuomo, you know, take that, take that blueprint that I've just given you and then have your speechwriters, like, make the, the edits uh, that are needed and then come out with that. Like, come out with guns blazing, metaphorically speaking, okay? Metaphorically speaking. Because if you don't have anything to apologize for, then you don't have anything to apologize for, right? And if you're going to go down, you might as well go down fighting these fuckers, all right? Okay, bye, everybody.